Dr. Miles, to speak about his extensive investigation into his own involvement in torture, including sanctions against physicians. Dr. Miles has published four books, and we have copies available of some of them tonight, including Opie Trade, America's Torture Doctors, and numerous articles on medical ethics, tropical medicine, human rights, and end of life in geriatric health care. He has served as president of the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities and received his Distinguished Service Award. Among his other awards is the National Council of Teachers of English's Orwell Award, George Orwell Award for Distinguished Contribution to Honesty and Clarity in Public Language. Dr. Miles also served as medical director of the American Refugee Committee for 25 years and his service as chief medical officer for 45,000 refugees on the Thai Cambodian border and projects in Sudan, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Indonesia, and the Thai Burmese border. He has taught in several countries, including involvement in medical school curriculum development in Cuba. Closer to home, Dr. Miles gave a closing lecture on medicine and social activism at Gustavus' 2006 Nobel Conference, which focused on medicine, prescription for tomorrow. And he's also a graduate of St. Olaf College. Over the years, Dr. Miles' work has changed healthcare insurance, end of life care, the use of restraints in nursing homes, refugee camp medicine, and prison medical ethics. I told him on my when I walk over to like the health night, I'm not sure how he's had time to do all this. The Ralph Wallenberg Memorial Lecture was established at the States in 1983. It honors the heroism and legacy of Ralph Wallenberg. About Dr. Miles to share a little bit more. Please help me in welcoming our guests. Continued 
to hand out passports to the reaching hands. And then he ordered everyone with a passport to leave the train and walk to cars parked nearby, all of which were marked with the Swedish colors. That day he saved dozens of lives. He was executed by Stalin in 1947 in Lubyanka prison age of 35. It's important to realize that Raoul Wallenberg did not engage in symbolic protest. Did not engage in the microethics of, well, it's a useful first step. Had more than just the courage to be inconvenienced. By the time he arrived in Budapest, <coughs> the Nazis had already deported 440,000 Hungarian Jews to death camps. 320,000 of those were immediately executed on arrival, and the rest were put to forced labor where many of them then died. There were 200,000 Jews left in Budapest when he arrived, <coughs> all of them slated for deportation and execution. Wallenberg, along with Carl Lutz, who was a Swiss consul, an incredibly crazy Italian, Giorgio Berlaska, who posed as a Swedish diplomat. He wasn't even, or Spanish, he wasn't even Spanish. They saved 100,000 lives, half of the remaining population of Budapest. Israel at the Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Museum, counts him among, as among the righteous among the nations. And it's for him that this lecture is dedicated. Now the problem is, when you get a guy like that, and you have to give a name lectureship after that, you kind of, you know, first you feel inadequate, you know, and then the other thing is he kind of steals the topic from you. So I'm going to give you a triptych lecture, three parts, and I promise to leave 15 minutes for questions. A year after the end of the war, while Wallenberg was in a Soviet prison, there was the second Nazi trial, the first special trial, it was the Nazi doctor's trial. 23 defendants were put on uh, trial, 22 of them were physicians, seven were sentenced to death by hanging, two of them were executed on the site of concentration camps where they did their experiments on um, uh, prisoners. Nine were given prison sentences, ten were acquitted, or seven were acquitted. I'd like to trace for you what's happened to physicians who are accountable for torture as a way of setting the background for the debate today in the United States. After the Nazi doctor's trial, we had in the World Medical Association, the WMA, in the green below, their Declaration of Geneva in 1948 saying doctors must obey international law. In 1975, the World Medical Association said doctors may not be complicit in torture. In 1997, they said no license should be given to any doctor who tortures who goes to another country. And in 2007, they said it is the duty of physicians to document and denounce torture. That last passage of the WMA was made because American doctors failed to document and denounce torture in the prisons of Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, and Barbara. The UN, United Nations has followed a similar trajectory passing the UN Principles of Medical Ethics, the Convention Against Torture in 1984, and UN Principles for Protection of Persons Under Detention which defined cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment in 1988. The 
seems clear. It's intuitively clear, if not clear by medical ethics codes, that doctors do not torture, we do not assist torture. Torture is not a medical activity. And yet it happens. And I'll show the scale in a little bit. This is my attempt to find all the doctors who've been punished for torture. Now there is a nifty little thing called the Google Translator. See that little place like this page thing? I don't know if any of you have ever pushed it. It's kind of cool what happens. You start out with an article like this, which is from a uh, newspaper, okay? And if you push that button, right there, <laughs> it's this. How cool is that? <coughs> All of a sudden it's in English, formatted just like in the original newspaper. Even, even the captions on the pictures are translated. All the links are translated. And furthermore, if you move your mouse over a word, what happens is you get to see the original language underneath so you can cross-check it. Like, justice sentenced him in 2000, that doesn't make any sense. But when you read the original language, it's the judge can sentence him. How cool. I loved it. So much so I spent like eight months playing with it. <laughs> That's what happens when you, you know, get a degree. Keep that in mind. Now, when you go searching for docs, you can find your this is what you find. Now, this is kind of a fun graph to make. Um, the little circles are docs who are punished by medical associations. Uh, if the circle's filled in, it means they're actually punished. If, if it's an open circle, it means that the hearing is currently underway. The boxes are courts. And then there are uh, slashes through the things that mean that they died during the process. And then the big circles are uh, sanctioned by international courts. I had fun with that, too. Now, the interesting thing is, who punishes docs who engage in torture? Well, it's fascinating. Who punishes them is medical associations. Notice that big purple blob in the large circle. But notice of the hearings in process, it's the courts, the green one. And we'll come to why in a little bit. Why do medical associations move in front of courts? Well, now courts and docs, and docs associations like the AMA handle different things. Medical associations punish docs for <coughs> breaking ethics. And we don't have much we can do about it. We can suspend the license or revoke it but we can't lock people up. Courts can lock people up. But since torture is not illegal in many countries, they can punish them for murder. Uh, they can punish them for kidnapping. For example, in Argentina, the docs, when a pregnant woman prisoner would die while in prison, well, actually, when she was slated to be killed, they would wait till she delivered the kid. They take the kid, the doctor write a birth certificate saying that the kid was actually the daughter of the commandante or the prison or some other prison official who wanted a kid because you wouldn't want a kid raised by some lefty family like the one that the woman came from. And then the woman was killed and her body was dropped in the ocean. The first guy after Nuremberg to be punished for torture was Dimitri Kopas in Greece, and he was court-martialed for dereliction of duty and sentenced to prison. Now there's a set of docs I'm not going to consider, like these three, who were not punished for acting as docs, but they were punished for acting as senior government officials. Dr. Bizimungo in Rwanda, who was the foreign minister of that country and who was prosecuted for genocide. Um, and uh, so, but this is different. 
because I'm interested in docs acting as docs for torture, and so I'm throwing all these guys out. They deserve to be thrown out. Now, in addition to courts and medical associations, there's this fascinating movement that's called denouncing. One of my favorite organizations for this is called, if there will not be justice, there will be denouncing. And this is occurring all over South America. And what they do is these groups will put pictures up of the docs, like this guy. They'll give their home address and phone number, their office address and phone number. They'll show pictures of the victims. They'll give a military biography of the person. And they'll say, go get him. He's a doctor of tortures. And they'll go to the doc's home with all the pictures of the victim. And they'll hold a big demonstration. And they'll write a list of indictments on the walls of his house and on the, on the street and sidewalks in front of his house so that his neighbors know who he is. And then they'll do the same thing over at the clinic because the courts won't prosecute their torturing doctors. We don't know why these docs torture. I'll talk about how common it is in a few minutes. My favorite is Amilcar Lobo. Now, Lobo, in Portuguese, means wolf. And so his book was titled The Hour of the Wolf and the Hour of the Sheep, because he called himself wolf when he worked in the prisons where he tortured 500 people to death. And it's used torture and assassination for thousands of years, and it's permitted as long as it's socially organized. For a moment, when the Inquisition's torture and murder of the Jews, the Nazis' similar actions four years ago, this is human nature. I'm not ashamed to be part of it. That's a psychiatrist, a prominent psychiatrist. Doc governments, just like ours, sheltered their doctors who engage with them. <coughs> Sometimes they require that before anybody can act against the doctor who engaged in torture, the military has to screen the case to determine if it's worthwhile. They enact like the amnesties. They excuse crimes committed under orders. They retroactively put in statutes of limitations. They refuse to let medical records out or they destroy medical records. Or if a doc does get punished, they just hire the doc into a military prison system or a military clinic system. So, how do docs get punished for torture? Well, Central, South America gives us a history, <coughs> and it's an important history. In the beginning, where you have a torture regime, first off, governments can't be divided just into torturing governments and non-torturing governments. Governments move back and forth. Britain tortured the IRA, and now is a non-torturing government. France tortured Nigeria, now it's a non-torturing government. The United States was a non-torturing government, now it's a torturing government. And it's slowly moving back. <clears throat> Torture is not aimed at an individual. It's not aimed at you. It's aimed at all your friends. That's why torture is aimed at teachers. It's aimed at journalists. It's aimed at labor union organizers. It's aimed at political leadership. Because the purpose of torture is to suppress civil society. Now, when a regime is torturing, unfortunately, medical associations usually are affiliate, politically affiliated with the regime. Medical societies tend to be conservative. As the torture of the regime begins to fall apart, the regime shifts to a different strategy. It begins to obstruct the idea of accountability for its torturing officials, including doctors. And civil society mounts increasing resistance against the organization, the government. And civil society tells the doctors, look, doctors do not torture. And the civil society, like the Mothers of the Plaza and the American Civil Liberties Union, <laughs> be 
begins to compile evidence of what has happened. And gradually, the medical association begins to dissociate from the regime. And the medical association begins to put sanctions on doctors who participated in torture in their official capacity. And finally, what happens is that the government then goes to full war with the government with the doctors and will even create new medical associations and employ sanctioned doctors in its own hospitals until the final step where the courts become internally independent and are able to move against people who committed crimes against humanity. Now it's important to realize that few doctors are ever punished. In Argentina, more than 200 doctors engaged in torture, only eight were punished. In Brazil, more than 110 are known to have been involved in torture, 22 were punished, and so on. And in fact, you can take countries, and you can see that countries can be divided into countries that simply will not allow any discussion of torture at all. In North Korea, you cannot discuss torture. Then you have countries like the United States, Great Britain, the Philippines, Venezuela, and Egypt, where they say doctors should not torture, but they will never punish any of their doctors who do. And then you have countries like Greece or South Africa, who will punish a token position. And then you have countries like Argentina or Brazil, which have systems for punishing doctors who engage in torture imperfect systems, but systems nevertheless. It is important to realize doctors are absolutely essential to modern regimes of torture. More than half of torture survivors report seeing a doctor supervising their torture. More than half. And torture is practiced by 110 countries in the world. And that doesn't include the prisoners who never see the doctor who's okaying the methods, or the one who signs a death certificate saying natural causes of somebody who's tortured to death. So regimes need torturing doctors. And on the other hand, doctors are a key source of the social norm against torture. And they ally with civil society <coughs> and bringing regimes to accountability. The last part of this triptych talk that actually is still working on it. We knew it had to be brought up. So when I saw the pictures of Dr. Gray, years ago. The pictures of the guards abusing prisoners. I wonder, well, like, where were the docks while this was going on? There had to be a medical system in that prison. And docks morally are human rights monitors. We are responsible for the health of prisoners. We are there when the Red Cross is, and we see people who are being hidden from the Red Cross. And even if we don't see the abuse ourselves, we see the signs of abuse, and we know that it's happening. Now this kind of picture came out with that kind of capture. But imagine it with this capture. Let me tell you the story of this picture. These seven men were brought into of a grave in the middle of the night. They were stripped. Sandbags were put over your head, which you can't see. They were kicked and stomped on. They were pushed up into a pyramid while a medic looked down from the catwalk above. The guards took turn running down the hallway and jumping on this pile like it was a leaf pile. Rainer, the guy standing there, took the prisoner's head in the side of his arm and he hit it like this. He said, oh, that hurts. Sergeant Fredrickson said, here, 
I'll show you how to do it. Stand up. The guy stood up, and he hit him on the sternum as hard as he could. And the guy said, my heart. I can't breathe. And he fell to the floor unconscious. And Fredrickson thought he killed him. So Fredrickson called a nurse, Helga Adolfo Morales, who came in. She saw the what she called a dog pile of prisoners, stacked up like cheerleaders do. She saw the guy down on the floor. She said, he's faking it. She walked out. She never reported it. But the nurse and medic saw while working it out the grave. Now, I'm going to tell you where my facts come from. They don't come from the New York Times or USA Today. I personally have read somewhere around 60 to 80,000 pages of government documents because they weren't designed to be text searched. Some of them were a little obscure. <laughs> These are DOD, Department of Defense Investigations, with sworn testimony, base policies, emails, death certificates, autopsies, some trial testimony. The only time I used a human rights group report or a media report was when I could find the underlying document. I put up all 60,000 pages on the web for anybody who doesn't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you look at what happened, these acts are exactly the kind of acts that we have punished other countries for engaging in as war crimes. When China or Burma Zimbabwe does these things, we say they are committing torture and war crimes. The only thing that's missing from this list is mutilation, cutting off hands, ears, that kind of thing. The buck stops here. George Bush's signature. I accept the legal conclusion of the Department of Justice and determine that none of the provisions of Geneva apply to our conflict with Al-Qaeda. Our nation will be a strong supporter of Geneva and its principles. But as a matter of policy, the United States Armed Forces shall treat detainees humanely and to the extent appropriate and consistent with military necessity in a manner consistent with principles of Geneva. Now, it anyway tells you that we're going to honor the principle of monogamy, but not the provision. Watch out. <laughs> Let's talk about interrogation first. Let's talk about medical clearance of interrogation. Before we do that, I want to defuse the ticking time bomb because our government studied it for 40 years. It does not work. No report of the scientific investigation of the ability on the interrogatory's power resistance has been discovered. Defense Intelligence University, comprehensive review of all nations' empiric data a perception of coercion can decrease the likelihood the source of the source will cooperate. Worse of influence strategies create a competitive dynamic. Rational persuasion and avoidance and pressure increase the likelihood of target commitment. Belief change and compliance was more likely when physical abuse was minimal or absent. That's your government speaking. That's their research basis. Rumsfeld, our former Secretary of Defense, was told that. He was told that it was an inferior technique. He was told that you can't recruit people who you torture. He was told it was inadmissible in courts. He was told that it would harm public support for the military. He was told that it would endanger our POWs who became taken, taken prisoner. And in fact, after the other great pictures came out, Whereas before we had gotten back every one of our soldiers who was taken prisoner in Iraq, no prisoner has come back alive. So he approved these techniques. 
Now, it's important to realize that when Rumsfeld did this, he brought in the medical system at the beginning. He said, Interrogata interrogations must be planned, deliberate actions that take into account a detainee's emotional and physical strengths and weaknesses. The prisoner has to be medically and operationally evaluated as suitable for the interrogation plan. And you have to have monitors. Now keep in mind, the functions of doctors in torture are to determine if the prisoner can withstand it, to decide how to administer it without scars, and to certify those who died as dying of natural causes. That policy went down Guantanamo Bay and over to Afghanistan. And after being piloted in Guantanamo Bay, it got taken over to Iraq, where it was implemented in Abu Ghraib there, using expertise from Afghanistan. In short, it was one policy for the entire Persian network. This is the poster from the wall of Abu Ghraib. Fear of Harsh, Fear of Mild, Pride Needle Up, Pride Needle Down, Utility. Dietary manipulation, environmental manipulation, exposure to heat and cold. Sleep adjustment, isolation, presence of dogs, sleep management, denying people sleep, sensory deprivation. Detainees must be medically cleared prior to interrogation. This is the organizational chart of Abu Ghraib. This kind of document drove me nuts. <laughs> Joint interrogation and debriefing center. The interrogation control element, that's a totally legitimate function. Where do you get your weapons? Where do you store them? How do you recruit? These are operational issues that are important to any interrogation system. Well, you'll notice that underneath it is a biscuit with Major Uthal. And underneath that are the Tiger teams, an interrogator, an intelligence officer, and a translator. This biscuit, the Behavioral Science Consultation Team, support interrogation operations. Operational behavioral psychologists and psychiatrists are essential to developing integrated interrogation strategies, that is, to exploit physical and emotional weaknesses. And furthermore, what he did was an act of genius, Rumsfeld. Previously, the guards, the guys over here, and the guards, he would take a prisoner to an interrogator and then take them back. But under the new system, you were responsible to the interrogator for breaking the prisoner down too. So there was no outside of the interrogation room. That is, the guards became active rather than passive with regard to the interrogation. Now the biscuit could use cultural psychology to break the prisoners down. They could use clinical records to break the prisoner down. You've got a shoulder separation? Well, holding you like this would be a good idea. Take, for example, the Katani interrogation log, 54 days log. Biscuit psychologist John Lesso was in charge. He advised on a plan of humiliation, including making the prisoner wear underwear, being sleep deprived, that is, for uh, up to 12 days at a time um, with short naps as he became increasingly exhausted, then a 36 hour downtime to flip the circadian clock, and then another uh, 12 days. A sexual degradation, a uh, woman guard would do what we call credit card checks where she would run her uh, fingers up between his buttocks, uh, instruct him on the uh, meaning of the Quran, uh, and then um, give him a lap dance. Um, a physician was in and out of the room measuring vital signs. This is all in the log, minute by minute. And at one point, they got this guy cooled down with an air, air conditioner so slow that his heart went slow down to 34 beats per minute. And then he had to be hospitalized. He went to the hospital, they warmed 
dropped him up. Then they loaded him back onto a gurney, took him by ambulance back to the interrogation room where the process continued. Medics were starting IVs in the interrogation room, denying him toilet privileges and forcing him to urinate on himself. Three teams of docs involved in this, not one medical complaint, the FBI complaint. And the government said, not torture. Now, when you go back then to look at the out of gray pictures, they are what the guards said they were. They were recording the implementation of the policy. Fear of harsh presence of military dogs. The guy with the uh, black hat over up on the uh, right, that's sleep deprivation. The guy outside on the hot summer day, that's environmental manipulation. The guy on the bottom right, that's a stress position. The guards were reporting the policy, not the guards as bad apples. Now deaths in prisons are a signal event because there are natural deaths in prisons, but there are also deaths by abuse. And that's why the Geneva Conventions, which we wrote at the end of World War II, because of the Nazi abuses, say that any time a prisoner dies in a POW facility, the death report has to be sent to the international community. When the Abu Ghraib pictures came out, there was a big question, who is this guy? How come we've never heard of any death in our prisons? Why does he have a big bruise on the side of his head? That's Monadel Abjamani, who was butt stroked on the side of his head with a rifle. Hit with a rifle on the side of his chest so that he had three broken ribs. Was brought to Abu Ghraib without a, and was taken to a room where his arms were tied behind his back, lifted up and tied to bars on a window above his back with a head of, with a cover over his head and told the medic, I feel like I'm going to die. The doctor the medic said, you're going to wish you were dead. And then a few minutes later, he did die. And they called in a medic. A doc pronounced him dead. The medic came to the room and started an IV, and he was wheeled up so as not to disturb the other prisoners. And the death was concealed from the public. And in fact, when you look at these five death certificates, what you'll notice is that the date of death in green, 2003, 13 August 2003, 25 August 2003, 22 August 2003, so on. But you look at the date of finalization, May 12, 2004, May 12, 2004, May 12, 2004, and so forth. Well, why were they all May 12, 2004? Well, the reason they were May 12, 2004 was because Jamadi's picture came out on May 1st, 2004, and the Pentagon decided to better clean up its act and have some candor about the deaths. Now, Mahush was a guy who kidnapped his two sons and left a not note at his house, turned himself into the base that came, told him, let your sons go. So he did. He tortured him for 16 days, multiple fractures all over his body, stuffed him head first into a sleeping bag, wrapped in the wire, <laughs> And then the CI case officer sat on him, and then he suffocated, and the doc said, looks like a heart attack. So when they came clean at May 12th, or May 20th, 04, with that bunch of death certificates you just saw and others, they released a set that showed that the most common cause of death was natural death. But now the documents that are out show us, in fact, that most of the deaths were shelling of prisons. You're not allowed to put a prison in an active war zone, by the way, or homicides. And then there's that group of others. And in fact, in 2008, we turned off the death reporting system again, and it hasn't been turned back on. Even though we have 40,000 prisoners, there were only two deaths reported last year. We only report men dying. This kid's death, 
indeterminate death. Yeah. What it says there is this guy was shot at close range in his locked cell by a guard. The prisoner had a round wound, the right submental, that's below the jaw, uh, which is uh, consistent with a single gunshot wound. No exit wound was seen on the back of the head. The prisoner's shirt had a large blood uh, in his uh, right upper mid back, prisoner's clothes uh, not uh, otherwise looked at, he was not further examined. At this point, I could not determine a cause of death since I'm not a licensed pathologist. <laughs> so this is a indeterminate cause. And so when you look at the causes of death in the prisons, of which there are about 200, a third of them are homicides, a third of them are shelling, 10% are natural, and the rest I can't figure out. Now, in addition to that, there's silence. The pictures we call the out grave pictures, they were screensavers. That's why they were discovered. Ducks were silent. They altered medical records to say trauma didn't exist. They didn't inquire. Prisoners reported being sodomized by a baton. The physician wrote no evidence of, sodom, of, of baton sodomy. And then later, six months later, said, well, actually, I didn't do a rectal exam, even though they told me to look for it. There's a huge problem here. And the problem is, that the U.S. medical community is absolutely essential to the war against torture. How can we criticize other countries' use of doctors to commit torture when we are silent on our own? How can we speak up on behalf of doctors in those countries like Brazil, where another psychiatrist pointed out that Dr. Lobo was engaged in torture? <coughs> How do we speak out on behalf of those doctors if we are silent on our own? How can we speak on behalf of the Geneva Conventions for the treatment of a Chinese lawyer who is in prison or for an American POW if we will not apply those to our own POWs? The framework of law has been taken down. Now, is it worth it? Ronald Wallenberg did not engage <coughs> in symbolic protest. He was not the kind of guy who would say, well, I voted, so therefore I've done my duty as a citizen. <coughs> There's a fascinating study that was done by Ona Hathaway when she was at Yale. And she looked at the question of does a nation that has signed an agreement to not torture, like the Convention Against Torture, are they less likely to torture? And she found out, no, that doesn't make any difference. She found that when a country, domestic institutions like media, the mothers of the plaza, positions for human rights, the American Civil Liberties Union, protest torture, hold the nation up to its commitments, that those nations move in the direction of compliance they decrease the amount of abuse. And so it is worth it to oppose torture. The United States medical profession stands internationally condemned at this point. The United Nations has said U.S. health professionals have systematically violated widely accepted ethical standards. Such unethical conduct violates the detainee's right to health. Government of the United States should revise the United States Department of Defense medical program to be consistent with the United Nations principles of medical ethics. For this type of condemnation, the American Medical Association, 
the Institute of Medicine, American Association for the Advancement of Science has been absolutely silent, silent to this day. JAMA has not written one editorial word on what has happened in these prisons. So we're left, I think, with an interesting juncture. We're left with you in this audience as essentially carrying out the earlier stated role of civil society to continue to articulate the values of civil society as, as embodied in what a liberal arts education stands for, recognizing that it is in fact the values of a liberal arts education, free speech, free press, a republic citizen, fact is the real object of torturing governments. And it is up to you to take a more morally engaged citizenship role in the direction which was outlined by Mr. Longer. Thank you.
genius of what happened after World War II was recognizing that World War II caused an enormous wound to civil society. And that generation got it exactly right. Universal Declaration of Human Rights, from that we'll build the Geneva Conventions, we'll build the, the United Nations. They said what we need is a new framework for conducting ourselves internationally. And the tragedy is that right now what we've done is we've jumped the entire Geneva Convention, Convention Against Torture Framework, as a rule of law. Because those documents don't just say don't torture. What they say is that no appeal to national emergency, no appeal to national sovereignty can ever justify an executive action to torture. And now what Miramar or uh, Zimbabwe can say to us, well, US policy is an appeal to national emergency and national sovereignty can justify executive torture. And so the question is right now, what do we do in a post-Geneva world to rebuild the framework of international law that's been trashed? And for that, we need documents, not photographs. are just careers. And I will say this, that what's so interesting, as you saw in the South American slides, the medical society has the more freedom of movement because the courts are so bound to the interests of the government. In fact, uh, just yesterday, a guy who, an innocent guy who we tortured, uh, sued the government. We can see that he's uh, innocent. And a federal judge ruled, well, he can't sue us for torture or damages related to torture because the government has, has not enacted a rule permitting that yet. Okay? Um, so, at any rate, what we're doing in the United States right now, I think, is looking very much like the denouncing movement in South America. We're beginning to see more and more websites carrying more and more health professional and lawyer names describing their crimes. Giving, telling where they're working and so forth. And I think that's going to be the movement for the intermediate future in the United States. But I'm not pessimistic because it takes a period of anywhere from usually two to ten years after a torture regime loses power before accountability really swings into play. The documents that you were talking about yeah. that were released, can you break those web addresses on, on the board to know if they're, or I don't know, if it's, if yeah. the documents you used are going to be available? You just to Google Human Rights, Rights Library, okay. Minnesota. Uh, there's a big section there called Medical Documents, or you can go to the ACLU website and just look up torture documents, and they have enough to really write your life. But if you want to do a small project, there are lots of small research projects that you can do out within those projects. Yeah. instance where a uh, doctor who was in charge of torture in prison was executed by a car bomb. Several have gone into exile. Now, one U.S. American psychologist, the guy who did the Katani interrogation I talked about, is currently in Austria because of the pressure. The problem is this. Is this vigilantism or not? I don't think so, and here's why. An ordinary crime is committed by a person against the state and the society. And so the state moves against murder, robbery, or so forth. The 
torture is a different kind of act because what it is is a crime by the government against the society in which the government decides that it is not accountable. And so that the ordinary framework here is, is really quite different and we don't have an international framework for policing states. The international court only punishes government leaders. It doesn't punish individual torturers. So the question is, what is the redress for balancing a crime by the government against the society? And I'm, I'm, the only thing I can tell you is I'm convinced it's not vigilantism, but I don't know what it is. Some people who are technicians in the field call it transitional justice. I'm happy to let it go with that. I'll take one more. Last crack. Can you talk about the war crimes for a moment in connection with the professionals who did these things that probably break and that's where it's going to be at? These physicians will not be prosecuted for war crimes because the current setup for war crimes largely focuses on heads of state, not on the role of practitioners. So when currently there is an effort to secure war crimes indictment against uh, Rumsfeld, Rice, uh, Addington, who is the White House lawyer, um, and a couple other senior U.S. officials, and those, uh, those indictments are currently wending their way through a court. It's important to realize that the theoretical basis for a war crime is that the, the torture or genocide are called crimes against humanity because they're crimes against all of us. You can't torture a Rwandan, or, or a police officer can't torture a Rwandan without it being a crime against all of us because it is a crime against humanity. And if you say it's a crime against humanity, then you also have to say that it is a crime with universal jurisdiction. If that policeman tortures somebody in Rwanda and it's a crime